Hey guys, Brandon here with iFast University. Uh, in this video, I wanted to give you guys something a little bit different that you may not have, have run across before. Um, I came across this idea or this subject matter maybe two years ago. Um, and it's this really cool blend of anatomy and neuroscience and biomechanics that I think is absolutely brilliant and I wanted to share with you guys. So what we're going to talk about in this video is this idea of enslavement. Um, and what it's going to bring us to is why whatever soft tissue work we may be doing with our clients is, is nearly useless. And we'll talk about some scenarios maybe where it, maybe it is helpful, maybe it isn't. Um, we're going to give some, some research to back these ideas up. So big broad question to kind of start us off is what limits movement? Right? And when we're thinking about movement or what might limit it, we've got to think about all the pieces to the puzzle here. So what pieces anatomically um, or what systems of the body kind of have to work together to produce movement? Well, we've got to have muscles, right? We've got to have something to shorten, to pull on bones, to move joints around their axes and, and get us around in the world, right? So maybe muscles are just too tight. Maybe muscles don't have enough sarcomeres in them. Um, stacked end on end to make the muscle long enough and maybe that limits our movement. Maybe it's tendons that are the culprit, right? Maybe tendons just aren't elastic enough or don't have enough stretch to them. Maybe the collagen in them is is a little different. Um, maybe the collagen in them isn't long enough. Maybe that limits movement. Maybe it's bones, right? We've all had a client or maybe you've experienced it yourself of where you get impingements, right? Where bones hit on bones, it doesn't feel awesome. Uh, but maybe just bones smashing into bones limit movement. And I mean, I could kind of agree with that. Maybe it's ligaments, right? Kind of just like tendons, maybe they're, they're not stretchy enough or the, the fibrous tissue that makes them up doesn't allow for enough movement at a joint. Maybe that limits that joint from moving. All right, I could kind of buy that too. Maybe it's the nervous system, right? We've got to have something to coordinate all these muscles to fire at the right time to move these joints so that we can do whatever we're doing. And maybe the nervous system just can't figure that out for some reason. It's another good possibility. And before we get any further, um, we're going to spend the next few slides talking about the hand. Um, but I want to make sure everybody understands this idea of degrees of freedom. So. In biomechanics and kinesiology, degrees of freedom is just the number of planes of motion a joint can produce movement in. Okay? And if we look at the hand, there's somewhere, or there is 16 degrees of freedom of the digits minus the thumb in the hand, right? So if we look at the most distal joint in the fingers, right, we just got one degree of freedom at each of those. So we got four degrees of freedom in the sagittal plane at those, at that joint. Look at the middle joint, again, only moves in the sagittal plane. We got four fingers, so we got four more degrees of freedom. And our most proximal joint, we got two degrees of freedom at each, right? So we got another eight. So we got a total of 16 degrees of freedom here. And if we look at the entire human body, there's roughly 244 degrees of freedom, okay? So again, in the hand, it's just a very small percentage of the entire human body. So let's dig a little bit deeper into some of our, our culprits that might limit movement. Okay, and since we're going to talk about the hand, we've got to talk about the muscles and tendons that go to control the fingers. Right. One we've got to look at is flexor digitorum profundus. It goes from the medial aspect of the arm down to all four digits and kind of fans out on its way there. Okay. Our next Muscle we got to talk about is flexor digitorum superficialis. Um, even though this picture here doesn't show it, right? It's just like our other flexor over here that starts at the medial aspect of the forearm and it kind of fans out and goes to all four digits again. Okay, so we have two muscles that are multi-tendinous muscles that each of them goes to each of the digits. And then lastly, the lumbricals. Um, the lumbricals are a little bit different. Okay. They don't start in the forearm, but they also only go to one digit, okay? So each lumbricle is only going to go to control a single digit. So they don't have these multiple tendinous units like we see in these two muscles. <clears throat> so
So a little bit deeper on these. If we look at flexor digitorum profundus, right? It's each of its tendons goes all the way to the most distal part of the finger. Okay, and it's the only muscle in the arm or hand that does this. So it's the only muscle that's going to move your fingertip, right? So if you were to kind of hold your ring finger or your pointer finger up, grab it with your other hand, and then just kind of try to move the tip of your finger, flexor digitorum profundus is the only muscle that's going to do that. Now let's add in flexor digitorum superficialis. Um, it's, again, these multi-tendinous muscle that goes to the middle joint of the fingers, okay? <clears throat> so instead of bending your fingertip, if you're trying to wiggle your pointer finger again, slide your other hand down <clears throat> and try to bend that middle joint, right? So you're bending the middle knuckle there. FDS is the only muscle that's gonna do that in the hand or, or arm. And then lastly, our lumbricals, which we mentioned, right? Lumbricals only go to a single digit Right, so they don't span out to each digit, and your lumbricals are going to bend at the most proximal joint of the fingers here. Right, so we're talking about this last knuckle, this metacarpal phalangeal joint. Um, lumbricals are the only muscle really that are going to do that for you. All right, so our other big culprit that could possibly limit movement is the nervous system. Right, and there's some cool principles about the nervous system that start to play into the story as we're building it. The first is that we see this, this divergence of the motor cortex, right? So this strip of brain right here, right? This first part of the blue here is the motor cortex. Really concerned with, the neurons here are really concerned with um, turning on different groups of muscles to produce movement. And if you were able to go into a lab and stimulate a very small area, even just a few neurons in the, the motor cortex, you would activate a whole bunch of different muscles, right? So we see this divergence where a single area in a single few neurons could go out and activate a bunch of different muscles, okay? On that same note, we also see some convergence. So if you're able to go in and shock or stimulate different areas of the motor cortex, you would activate a single muscle too, right? You're, again, you're going to activate a bunch of them, but you can spread out this activation and you would still get activity in a single muscle. Okay, so we see this divergence and this convergence of the nervous system that are going to come into play here and maybe explain which one of our culprits here is limiting movement. And the last thing of the nervous system, which plays into this convergence and divergence, um, if we look at the motor homunculus, right, this little map of our body on our brain, um, We'll take a look at the hand here, and according to kind of these cartoony pictures, everything is really well separated, right? I got my little finger, I got my ring finger area, I got my middle finger area, index finger, and thumb area, okay? Um, as soon as we look a little bit deeper, I wish I had a better picture of this, our motor strip here isn't so well laid out anymore, right? You see some of the fingers are interdispersed up in the wrist area, um, and some of them are by the elbow and the forearm areas now. So it's not as clean as we would like to think, right? It's really this kind of messy mosaic, um, this hodgepodge of different muscles and limbs that are outlined here, right? It's not as clean or the, as these cartoons may make it out to be, or as like we would think it would be. All right, so finally to this enslaving idea, right? And the, the study below, <clears throat> defines enslaving as the involuntary force production by fingers not explicitly involved in a force production task. Right, so if you were to hold your hand up, keep your finger straight, and try and bend your middle finger down to the palm of your hand, your other fingers are going to move. Right? If you were to do the same thing with your ring finger, you're going to see movement in some other fingers as well. Right? So that's really what we're talking about is, if I try to move a single finger, how much do the other fingers move? So the study that you just saw cited um, came up with a brilliant way to kind of measure this. So they had a force transducer or something that just measures how much force um, is each finger producing. And they made individual little slings for the fingers, right? They were able to slide the index, the middle, and the ring finger into these slings. Say, so, hey, I need you to push 
with this finger and they could see how much force inadvertently the other fingers produced. All right, so kind of to tie in this anatomy with the study idea, right, they were able to take these little loops on the fingers, put them on the distal interphalangeal joint, and really look at how much enslaving is there of flexor digitorum profundus. <clears throat> they will do the same thing, kind of slide those slings down on the finger. <clears throat> look at the middle joint here, so the proximal interphalangeal joint, and test how much enslaving is there with this FDS muscle. And then lastly, they're able to slide the slings all the way down the finger and test the metacarpal phalangeal joint and really see how much enslaving is there at the lumbricals. Right, and if we think back to the anatomy of these, right, we had these two multitendinous muscles that really fan out um, from a single muscle and have tendons that go to each finger. Okay? Versus our lumbricals that only attach to one finger, they don't have these multitendinous units going to separate fingers. So if it's the anatomy that limits things, these multitendinous muscles should have a higher enslaving effect, okay? And our single, um, single tendon muscles should have a much lower enslaving effect if it's the anatomy, the muscles and the tendons that limit movement. <clears throat> so what this research came up with is they had an ind their index finger, middle finger, and ring finger, and the thickness of the arrows here tells you how much enslaving there was. So if you went to move your little finger um, and they're testing the most distal joint of the hand or the fingers. Go to move your little finger. Your ring finger is going to move a lot, even if you're not trying to move it. Right? If you go to move your ring finger, your middle finger is going to move a lot. If you go to move your index finger, your middle finger is still going to move some, even though you're not trying to move it. Okay. And then our other multitendinous muscle, right, flexor digitorum superficialis. They see basically the same numbers, or the same proportions of enslaving at that joint. Okay. And now where it gets kind of cool is where we add in the lumbricals. And they found the exact same ratios of enslaving in the lumbricals. So we had these multitendinous muscles up top versus single tendinous muscles at the bottom. And we see the same enslaving. Right? So what can we conclude from that? Well, we can decide is that it's not soft tissue that limits movement. It's the nervous system. Right? And really when we're going to talk about degrees of freedom here again in a second but the nervous system has a lot of things to figure out if somebody's going to try to move and for ease of doing that it's going to couple or group things together and enslave them together um, so that it can do whatever else it needs to do at that time so if you have a client that has a limited straight leg raise or maybe can't squat how you'd want them to squat right, it's it's not a soft tissue issue we have a nervous system problem. Their nervous system has grouped things together for some reason, and now they can't separate them to move appropriately, or can't make different groups move together appropriately. All right, so back to this idea of degrees of freedom. Um, we said there were 16 degrees of freedom at the digits, 244 in the whole body. All right, so we're talking about just 6.5% of the entire degrees of freedom in the entire body. Right? And Arguably, the hand is our, probably the most important uh, <clears throat> important thing for us to move as humans, right? We have a lot of fine motor tasks to do with the hands. And if your brain has coupled these things together, then one of the most important body parts to have independent movement in, and it's only 6.5% of the entire degrees of freedom of the body, I almost guarantee you that in the other 93.5%, it's coupled things together too, for whatever reason it's decided to do that. So as I was making this presentation, um, you know, I, we kind of get sequestered over at IFAST or I, I do a lot of lab work and kind of get to one line of thinking or at IFAST we're around groups of people that kind of think the same of, as us. Um, so I wanted to see what the rest of the world thinks that they're doing with whatever soft tissue work they're doing. And overwhelmingly, what I found is that the rest of the world will say, hey, you know, if I have a muscle that's underactive, let's foam roll or lacrosse ball or whatever magic tool you want to try to rub on your skin. 
Um, <clears throat> let's foam roll the middle of this muscle, activate some muscle spindles, which we know will go into the spinal cord and reactivate that muscle. And you know, I, I can kind of agree with that, but because that circuitry is there and I 100% agree that if you activate muscle spindles, you're going to go back and it's going to activate that muscle. I agree with that, right? So the rest of the world would say, hey, you got an underactive muscle, foam roll the middle of it, or lacrosse ball the middle of it, whatever you're doing. Activate these muscle spindles, it's going to turn that muscle on. And I would agree with you. <clears throat> and then also, if I got an overactive muscle, I would say, hey, I got an overactive muscle, roll the ends of it near the attachment points, try to activate these Golgi tendon organs that we know go into the spinal cord, have a few synapses, and eventually turn off that muscle. And, I mean, I agree with that. If I activate Golgi tendon organs, you're going to shut whatever muscle that was down a little bit. 100% agree with that. Um, but we got one really big flaw kind of in this thinking. And that is, when we go to ask our clients to move or we go to teach them to move, there are a billion other things besides these few local circuitry neurons that are going to help them move. A billion other signals that are going to happen for them to move, right? Um, most of them coming from the brain or the or the brainstem. <clears throat> and if we're activating this local neural circuitry, or that's what they think they're doing at least, um, as soon as your client goes to move, we got a billion other things happening. So that's probably not not explaining things here, if um, or or giving foam rolling uh, a better light in my in my eyes. Right, so big conclusions from this soft tissue usually doesn't limit movement. Um, and I say usually because if, if you have a client that has, a, has been shot in the leg or has a stab wound or something, then you may really have a soft tissue limitation, right? Or um, if they've had a tendon reattached or whatever it is, you may have a soft tissue limitation. But for your average general population client or average athlete um, that hasn't had anything crazy surgery-wise or injury-wise, then it's probably not a soft tissue issue. Right? And then as we just talked about, um, the rest of the world would try to explain this by saying that soft tissue, um, soft tissue work activates these muscle spindles or GTOs. And again, I agree with that, but we're talking about a very few, um, very few neurons here. When we're talking about movement, there's billions and billions of neurons working. So you know, we're not attacking the right thing, I don't think. <clears throat> so what do we do? Right, spent the last 15 minutes or so saying, hey, here's my case for not, not doing this with my clients. <clears throat> with whatever foam rollers or lacrosse balls or magic stuff you want to try to rub on your skin with your clients, um, I'm probably not going to waste my time with it with anybody I work with. Right? I know a lot of people that maybe only see their clients for a half hour or 20 minutes um, and I don't want you to waste your time or your client's time using something that I don't think there's a ton of evidence or a ton of physiology to explain. Um, <clears throat> I just, I want to save people time, right? So what do we do instead? Put your clients in situations where they can successfully learn to move, right? Don't be afraid to regress your client's exercises if need be. Um, if you give them something too hard, it's definitely going to impair their movement. All right, so this is a, a client I used to work with. Um, this left picture here, trying to do a goblet squat, and then our right picture looks a lot different. Okay, the only difference between these two pictures is the kettle pound or the kettlebell was three pounds lighter in the right picture. Same day, same girl, didn't cue her or coach her any differently. I gave her a different kettlebell and put her in a in a situation where she can now be successful and learn to squat. Right, um, and. I mean, the picture on the right is about as good of a goblet squat as you're going to see anywhere. Again, no coaching or anything. It's just I put her in a situation now where she can successfully learn to do what I'm asking her to do. And secondly, learn to cue your clients appropriately. Um, if you guys haven't watched Jay's videos here on IFAST University, please go check them out. They're, Jay is by far one of the most influential people um, in my fast, and I would... and the whole of IFAST as well. Um, when it comes to cueing or working with your clients, 
Um, he's able to come up with these great cues that are really witty and stick with his clients, right? Something really simple that will stick with his clients. But at the same time, he's getting everything that he would want out of that cue, right? He's changing their, a little bit of their motor control and muscle activation, and he's getting his clients to remember it. Um, so if you haven't seen Jay's videos or watched Jay or talked to Jay about cueing, whether it's go watch in the videos or get on the Facebook page, please get a hold of Jay if you want to learn to cue better. <clears throat> and then most importantly, um, I want people to start to think about the things they're doing a little bit more. Right, so why am I doing this? Why does my client need this? What is this doing? And then in my eyes, what physiology, anatomy, or biology might explain this? Okay. Um, again, I, I work in a research lab and I, um, I work at a university. <clears throat> so I have a little bit of bias, but there has to be a little bit of physiology or anatomy or biology or neuroscience that, to give me some hope of what I'm trying to do. Okay. I just, I don't see that yet in foam rolling or soft tissue work. I don't see it yet. <clears throat> and then how do I know that this is doing what I think it is? Do I have a test? Do I have a retest that's fairly objective? Um, that I know that I'm getting what I want from whatever I'm doing, right? So if any of you guys have seen Bill do physical therapy on somebody, um, He's, he has a test, he does an intervention, and then he has a retest immediately, right? I'm not saying we have to be physical therapists, but have a, a fairly objective test, whether it is watching your client squat and watching them unbiasedly, hopefully. Um, but have a test, have some measure that you're able to use to say, hey, did this work? Did it make what I'm doing better? <clears throat> and then a few disclaimers to end here. Um, I'm not... I'm not saying to, to go burn your foam rollers and, and get on the internet and yell at everybody that uses foam rollers. But like if I have a client that walks into the gym and they love foam rolling because they've read a hundred things on the internet and it is one of their favorite things in the gym, then by all means, I'm going to let them foam roll still, right? Um, <clears throat> and now we get into a kind of a social thing and whatever else you want to get into. But again, if my client likes it or they think that it makes them feel better, or that they love doing it every time they walk in the gym, then by all means, I'm still going to let them do it, right? <clears throat> and second disclaimer is when you're foam rolling or lacrosse ball or whatever you're using, there are some afferent signals getting all the way to the brain um, that the brain can potentially use. But I just don't think that it's enough information for the brain to, make, to decide something new or completely new to do there. Um, and maybe for some people it is, right? I just, my personal experience, I've never seen anybody foam roll or lacrosse ball for 20 minutes and their squat get immediately better. But I have seen that with cueing somebody the correct way. Um, so again, there are afferent signals getting to the brain. Is it enough? In my opinion, probably not. For some people, maybe it is. <clears throat> All right, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this talk. Again, Something I came across a few years ago that I think is this awesome blend of anatomy and biomechanics and neuroscience um, that a group of researchers has looked at for a while. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully you guys found it useful. Um, if you guys did find it useful, please feel free to share the or spread the word about IFAST University. Again, we, we love talking with everybody and seeing everybody at conferences and just love growing this community that we have here. So if you guys enjoyed it, please feel free to spread the word. And I'll see you guys next month.